Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. As always, I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today, oh boy, today I've caught a big fish. Oh yeah, that's for sure. So, if you don't know him, that's because you probably live with your head buried in the ground, and that's something we're going for sure to talk about today. But for, uh, anyway, I have to introduce him for people who don't know him. And this excellent archetype of male beauty you're just Ooh. seeing <laughs> is Dr. Gad Saad, professor of marketing at Concordia University. He's also the holder of the research chair in evolutionary behavioral sciences and Darwinian consumption. He's in fact the founder of the field of Darwinian consumption. He's been the recipient of several awards and is also a prolific writer, both a popular blogger for Psychology Today and the author of three books, including The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, and is also a fellow YouTuber, the host of The Sad Truth, which I follow. And just before we start, I have to say this, otherwise Dr. Sad will sue me afterwards, your most excellent and magnificent Lord of the Universe, Emperor of all things, Professor Dr. Gad Sev. Thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Congratulations, you've now won the award for the greatest introduction in the history of mankind. Thank you, I am humbled by that introduction. <laughs> oh, by the way, at the beginning when I referred to you being an archetype of male beauty, I wasn't referring to a Jungian archetype. Let's be clear. <laughs> I'm not I'm not using mumbo jumbo here, okay? No, no, right. Very good. Very good. <laughs> okay. So, let's get started. First of all, I think that it is very interesting particularly for, particularly for people who don't know you yet for us to know a little bit of your background. So, as far as I know, you were introduced to the beauty, the parsimony, and the explanatory power of evolution. You're even using my terms. <laughs> <laughs> of, of evolutionary psychology uh, through the book Homicide, written sure. by Dr. Martin Daly and Dr. Margot Wilson, correct? But uh, what was the reason that led you to choose uh, among all of the different aspects of human behavior that you might have chosen specifically to study and to apply evolutionary theory and its principles to consumer behavior and marketing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I, after my undergrad, I did an MBA. Uh, I always knew that I was going to you know, pursue an academic career, but I wasn't sure exactly whether I would be uh, you know, going into, say, quantitative marketing, which would be uh, applying mathematical models to study consumer choice. Uh, actually, that was the goal when I, after I finished my MBA and went to Cornell for my PhD, given that I had a background in mathematics and computer science, the idea was to probably be, you know, an applied mathematician, specifically applying mathematical models, as I said, in studying decision making. But I was, I had always been very interested in the behavioral sciences. At one point, I even considered whether I wanted to uh, be a clinical psychologist. I lost interest in clinical psychology for two main reasons. Number one, uh, I didn't think that I had the right personality for it. I mean, I had the right personality in that I very much want to help people, but I had the wrong personality in that I didn't think that I could detach myself from the problems that I would hear. I think I thought that it would probably you know, kill me. Uh, and so that was one reason why I didn't like clinical psychology. I also didn't like clinical psychology because while, of course, it does have some scientific foundations, it is also very prone to quackery. And so in the history of, you know, uh, psychotherapy, there's endless, you know, complete garbage that has been uh, uh, erected uh, as viable, you know, theories to understand how to uh, help people. And so I, being someone who was very scientifically rigorous, I thought, okay, well, I'd like to study behavior, but in some other context. I was also interested in forensic psychology. I was fascinated by criminal uh, behavior. 
but then again, I thought it's just too dark. I don't want to spend my whole life. And so I thought that consumer behavior was a place where all of our human nature was at display, but in a context that was somewhat more positive. I mean, there is dark, dark aspects of consumption, right? Pathological gambling, eating disorders, pornographic addictions. But generally speaking, it seemed that it was a nice place to apply the, 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 the frameworks that I was interested in applying to a context that everybody could relate to. And so I thought consumer behavior seemed like the right thing to do, especially since I had an MBA. So when I went to Cornell, my idea was to be, a, as I said, a quantitative marketer. Then I met uh, a Professor Jay Russo, who is a very well-known uh, cognitive psychologist, uh, who actually his first paper ever, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was with Amos Tversky, the gentleman who ended up dying before he won the Nobel Prize with Daniel Kahneman. And so very quickly, I got immersed into the behavioral decision-making paradigm. And so I switched from being a likely quantitative jock, as they say, to being a behavioral scientist. But at that point, as you said, evolutionary psychology was still not in the cards. Uh, and it's only when I took the advanced social psychology course on the advice of my supervisor, uh, this was a course by Professor Dennis Regan, when I read Homicide by doctors uh, Daly and Wilson, that the epiphany happened. And so it was a circuitous route, but a route that I'm really glad that I found because uh, I can't imagine my life without evolutionary psychology at this point. Oh, well, me neither. And by, <laughs> the way, and by the way, I got into evolutionary psychology the first time through the book, The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker. So that, that's basically my background in evolutionary psychology because I didn't really study it in college, but anyway. Well, I think, I think most people, uh, or certainly most people who currently work as you know, professionally in evolutionary psychology, all have that story of epiphany. Uh, uh, it, because it really is one of those situations where you have episodic memory. You know, you know, for example, when people say, I remember exactly where I was when I heard about 9-11. And I truly think that when you are first exposed, to use the terms that you mentioned earlier, to the parsimony, to the explanatory power, to the theoretical coherence of evolutionary psychology, short of you being a blind ideologue, and we can talk about that eventually, uh, it really is arresting. It stops you because with such elegance, you're able to explain phenomena that you otherwise, when you look at the social science literature, they come up with unbelievably contorted ways to explain things, most of which are perfectly incorrect. And yet here is this beautiful theoretical lens that just offers you wonderful explanations. And so in the exact same way that you had it for Blank Slate, I had it for Homicide. You know, I know that David Buss has a similar story. I know that Marty Hazelden has a similar story. Every top evolutionary psychologist has exactly that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to talk about a little bit later in the interview about nomological networks of cumulative evidence. But before that, I guess that, I mean, you got into consumer behavior and marketing. And I mean, who would have guessed that because we as humans were evolutionarily endowed with these mechanisms to promote our survival, our reproduction, and other things we're going to talk about, that these same innate mechanisms would motivate us to consume, right? Exactly right. And by the way, I should mention that, uh, just so that people can kind of contextualize, I truly define consumer behavior in a all-encompassing manner. So it's not just, and I, I talk about this very early in the evolutionary basis of consumption, it's not just, uh, you know, the consumption of Starbucks and Coca-Cola and marketing is not just, uh, you know, Procter & Gamble. Uh, everything is consumer behavior. I mean, we are consumatory by nature. So we consume friendships, we consume religious narratives, we consume marriages, mate search is a form of shopping. Uh, so, so it's not, so it's a, when you asked me earlier, why did you want to study consumer behavior? Well, the reality is because I thought that that's the most likely place where I could study the intricacies of human nature. Uh, because short of breathing, the thing that you and I do most is consume. People are currently, when they're going to be watching this, they're going to be consuming our chat. They're going to be consuming uh, the ideas that are flowing. So 
so this is why I thought consumer behavior was such a perfect thing. And in terms of marketing, I, I recently released, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago, I released a, a sad truth clip where I said that marketing is life and life is marketing. Everything is marketing. And again, I define this in a very broad sense. When animals engage in sexual signaling, they are marketing themselves. They are advertising themselves. So I think people have a incorrect confusion regarding the, the way that the term marketing is used. Marketing is a colloquial term. You know, how does a restaurateur market his restaurant or his menu means one thing. Marketing as a scientific di discipline is really at the intersection of everything, biology, psychology, anthropology, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's, it's very interesting that you refer to religion, for example, because I had the question for you specifically about, for example, religion and the arts, because I mean, traditionally people would classify things as religion and art because they are part of culture as being the object of study of the humanities, Right. Yeah, I guess. But I, I mean, it, it, that isn't really the case because religion and the arts also can be looked to as the, the result of an evolutionary process, both genetic and cultural, correct? Oh, absolutely. So in, in several of my books, I have uh, chapters dedicated to what I call fossils of the human mind, cultural products as fossils of the human mind. And so the idea is that in the same way that a paleontologist, if he or she wishes to understand the phylogenetic history of a species, the, the evolutionary histories of a species, typically the currency that the paleontologist uses is skeletal remains or fossils, right? And then he or she can reconstruct uh, incredibly detailed accounts, you know, literally down to what they ate uh, from species that uh, have been extinct for certainly over 65 million years. Now, I use the same principle, if you'd like, to study the phylogenetic history of the human mind. But of course, the human mind doesn't fossilize, it's organic. And there, But what does fossilize, I argue, are the cultural products that human minds leave behind. And so in the same way that I could study fossil remains, I could study cultural remains. And therefore, I could look to uh, an, a, an, a, a poem from ancient Greece written 2,500 years ago in a completely different time, at a completely different place, in a different culture, uh, and I completely understand the emotional torture that the author is going through. As a matter of fact, him and I are a lot more similar than different. We, uh, the, the exact same software is, is running our respective minds. And therefore, if I want to understand what it, you, you mentioned earlier, archetype, what, are, what is the archetype of the male you know, the, the male archetype that f women fantasize about, well, I can go to literature, you were mentioning earlier art, I could do a content analysis of literary narratives and show that women in Bolivia and in Gabon and in Japan fantasize about pretty much the exact same guy. Uh, I could do a content analysis of religious narratives, I could do a content analysis of song lyrics. So troubadours from 800 years ago sang about the exact same things that hip hop artists sing today. The style is very different. The wording is very different. How direct the language is, is very different. But they're, they're singing about the exact same things. There is no culture that's ever been uncovered, uh, as I've become famous for saying, where uh, a male singer says, hey, Linda, you're gorgeous. I'd love to have sex with you. But unfortunately, you don't have social status, no sex for you. Uh, but of course, there is one trillion such songs the other way around where women say no status, no job, no ambition, no sex for you. And that song exists in Pakistan and in Gabon and in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, in your books, at least what I got from them is that uh, practically the entirety of our consumer behavior stands on four, four big pillars. 
that is four big uh, evolutionary modules that we have that are survival, reproduction, kin selection, and reciprocal altruism, correct? So could you please uh, explain each of them and particularly kin selection and reciprocal altruism? Absolutely. Because I guess that survival and reproduction, anyone can understand. Although they may not necessarily see how they're applied in a consumer behavior context, so it might be worthwhile to cover all of them. So survival, of course, is, uh, is via natural selection. So any adaptation that confers a survival ad advantage as an adaptation would fit under that module. So then the idea becomes, what are some specific consumer phenomena that are manifestations of that evolutionary vestige? So for example, food consumption is an obvious one. So there are all sorts of food phenomena that are nothing but manifestations of the survival module. The fact that you and I are much more likely to prefer high calorie tasty foods than raw celery or, or you know, grass juice, it doesn't come because of mysterious socialization. It, it comes from the fact that we've evolved taste buds that are meant to be adaptations to caloric uncertainty, caloric scarcity. The fact that we are easily uh, easy to succumb to uh, food hoarding. Uh, if we go to a buffet, if we go to an all-inclusive uh, vacation where you can eat as much as you want, it's very likely, even for the most disciplined person, to not come back having put on weight because we succumb to something called the variety effect. The variety effect is precisely what causes people, if you give people, uh, say, M&Ms, candy of one color versus M&Ms that are multicolored, even though the colorant is completely odorless and, and uh, take, take, I mean, it doesn't change the taste or the smell, yet people end up eating a lot more from the bowl that has multicolors because it tricks your visual system into hoarding more because there's greater variety. Uh, so these are some food examples, but we could also look at uh, the survival module, but at other phenomena. For example, the prospect refuge theory is a theory that explains landscape preferences. So we tend to prefer landscapes or settings that offer us wide visual prospect, but grant us refuge. So I can see without being seen. This is why we tend to prefer natural landscapes that look like the savanna. Uh, well, that principle could then be applied to the design of commercial spaces, retail stores, commercial stores, hospital rooms, uh, uh, urban designs of neighborhoods, all of these things, if they use principles from prospect theory or from biophilia, the idea being that we have a biophilic instinct, we have a love of nature, then if we use these principles, we end up having c customers who want to stay longer in the store, we end up having uh, students who do better on exams if they are in rooms that have higher biophilic scores. And so there are all sorts of downstream effects of incorporating evolutionary thinking into design principles. So that's survival. Sh should I go on or do you want to interject or do you don't mind if I give you a long answer? Uh, no, ju just to give a quick an anecdote, yeah. perhaps, because I mean, uh, it is interesting because uh, in what you said, you already implied, I guess, that when people refer to, when people give some examples of ex exceptions of people, like for example, um, someone comes to me and tells me when we talk about sex differences, oh, but my cousin Ben is married to a woman yeah. who has a big mustache, squared chin, wild shoulders, a big yeah. belly and burps and farts all the time. <laughs> and, and what I usually tell those types of guys is something like, oh, you know, my great grandmother, Mary, uh, also practically only ate beans and potatoes, but that was because she lived in dire poverty and didn't have access to fat and sugar. Right. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, so th th that cognitive bias, and I guess later we could talk about a, a class of these types of idiotic biases. Uh, th I call it the, uh, my aunt Linda is taller than my uncle Bob, so bruh, it's not true that men are bigger than women. Uh, but this, this, is, this is something that, I, this is a, a form of stupidity that I have faced repeatedly over my 25 plus year career. Uh, so yeah, I hear you. Uh, so to go back to uh, the four modules, so we've covered quickly survival. Reproduction, of course, deals with uh, things that arise through sexual selection, right? S certain adaptations could not have arisen through natural selection, 
because in many cases they actually result in a decrease in your survivability. And of course, the classic example, and I'll use it because that's the one that everybody's sort of familiar with, the peacock's tail could not have evolved through natural selection because that big tail reduces the likelihood of him being able to escape predators. Having the iridescent colors that are very conspicuous makes him more visible to predators. So it couldn't be that it's a form of camouflaging because it's the opposite of that. But it, it evolves through recurring female mate choice precisely because, and this is advertising, this is marketing, because he is signaling that a, an honest signal, look, despite the fact that this reduces my survivability, I'm standing here, I must be the top guy, you should mate with me. So it's an honest form of advertising. Mm -hmm. And there goes a shout out to Dr. Zahavi, right? There goes a shout out to Dr. Zahavi. So this is known, the different principles are called honest signaling. And, and, or costly signaling. In other words, a signal has to be costly for it to be honest. And one of the ways by which a signal is honest is that it has to be handicapping. It has to handicap you in some clear way. And then this is linked to what's called Zahavian signaling, precisely because uh, Amot Zahavi, a ornithologist from Israel, applied these principles to things like the Arabian babbler, uh, which is a type of uh, bird. So, so I take then this idea of reproduction or, or adaptations that evolve through sexual selection and then I demonstrate that countless things that we do as consumers is nothing but a manifestation of this, right? So the fact that we use sex-specific products to ameliorate our positioning in the mating market, I mean, is due to exactly that. The reason why 99% of Ferrari owners are male despite the fact that there are countless women who are millionaires and billionaires, yet they don't line up to buy Ferraris, doesn't come from the evil patriarchy. It comes because this is a form, this is a form of peacocking. The Ferrari is the peacock's tail. Of course, women also engage in sexual signaling, but of course they use different trajectories to achieve the same desire to, to, to sexually signal. Uh, so for example, I did a study with one of my former doctoral students uh, well, at the MSc and PhD student, where we looked at women's uh, consumption patterns throughout their menstrual cycles. And not surprisingly, if you understand evolutionary theory, when women are in the maximally fertile phase of their menstrual cycles, when they are in the ovulatory phase, this is when they are most vigorously engaging in beautification practices. Uh, uh, regarding the previous stuff about cars, I did another study with one of my other graduate students where we looked at what happens to men's testosterone levels when you put them in cars and ask them to drive, not imagine driving, actually driving, either a Porsche uh, and then a beaten up sedan. Downtown Montreal, which is called the, which is a lek, a lek, L-E-K, is a zoological term that captures uh, what happens in many species. Typically, males do this, uh, where it, there's a physical space called a lek where the males enter that lek and engage in vigorous displays. The females sit at the periphery watching these displays and then they choose the optimal male. Well, of course, I argue that there's endless such forms of lecking in the consumer context. And so what we found in that study, to go back to the, uh, the car study, is that we took salivary assays to measure men's testosterone levels after driving the Porsche or the sedan in downtown Montreal in the weekend, which is a lek, versus on a semi-deserted highway, and not surprisingly, the endocrinological response was extraordinary. Men's testosterone levels shot up when you put them in a Porsche. And so I take a principle that is very common and, and documented in the animal kingdom, and then I demonstrate how consumers are nothing but another form of animal. Uh, so now we move on, I think, to the two that you were most keen on, on, on covering because you thought that maybe they're a bit more intuitive. So kin selection, is the mechanism that explains altruism that is directed towards kin. So, what if 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 organisms are uh, have evolved to to only care about their survival? How how can we then explain the endless documented cases where all sorts of species engage in incredible risks to save their kin? Right. Uh, well, it turns out, of course, that evolution doesn't care so much about the organism. The organism is just a vehicle. Uh, to extend the genes, it, it really operates at the gene level. Uh, some will argue against this, but we don't have to get into the, the, the general debate. Uh, so, 
I share, on average, half my genes with my brothers or my kids. Uh, I share less genes on average with my nephews. And so I could still be increasing my inclusive fitness if I invest in my kin. And so kin-based altruism or kin selection is the mechanism that, that explains these phenomena. So then I take this principle and I apply it in consumer context. So various forms of consumer investments in our kin would be under the rubric of kin selection. But then we come to reciprocal altruism, which seeks to explain altruistic behaviors towards those who are not my kin. In some cases, they could be close friends, but in some cases, they could be random strangers. Why would I jump into a river to save Ricardo Lopez? I mean, I just know him from the show. He's not really a friend. Uh, he's not quite a stranger. I sort of know him. Why would I risk my life to save him? And so reciprocal altruism is the uh, phenomenon. Uh, kin selection was uh, documented beautifully by uh, uh, Bill Hamilton, who regrettably passed away on an expedition uh, in Africa to try to uh, identify the the roots of the uh, uh, HIV virus. Uh, I think he had been bitten, if I'm not mistaken. He got malaria, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and and uh, is, am, I, am I right? Do you know if that's the case? I think it was through. Uh, I'm not sure. I think maybe s someone will, will tell us in the comments section if, if I'm getting my story straight. Uh, he was a, a brilliant guy. I never had the pleasure of, of meeting him. Uh, and then uh, Robert Trivers is the gentleman who explained uh, the mechanism of reciprocal altruism. And so you could think about it originally as having evolved as an insurance policy, right? Uh, my family is running is running around in the savanna, not knowing whether we're going to have enough food to survive, uh, you know, the, for the next week. Uh, your family, which is also which is not related to me, you're, we're not kin, uh, is facing the same problem. Well, if you bring down the big game today, perhaps you'll consider sharing the spoils with me. On, of course, the assumption that next time around, when you'll be in need, I'll I'll reciprocate. And so there needs to be. Uh, a context where repeat interactions are likely to happen and this then places the selection pressures for reciprocal altruism to evolve at least for social species. This is why we have reciprocal grooming in many primates. I groom your back from parasites and then you hopefully will do it for me. It's literally I scratch your back, you scratch mine. So the, the expression is literally true when it comes to reciprocal grooming. And so of course I take this principle and say well are there examples of uh, this the signature of reciprocity in the consumer and marketing context and the answer is of course if you and I are very good friends we go through a ritual whereby I remember your birthday and invite you on your birthday with the expectation that you will reciprocate when it's my birthday now from a strict classical economic perspective the whole exercise is completely futile because I'm going to pay $50 for your meal. You're going to reciprocate and pay $50 for my meal. We're left at the same final utility point. Who cares? Let's not do this. Well, we do this because that ritual of reciprocity is what I argue oils our friendship. It's the means by which we solidify, by which we maintain, by which we signal how important we are to each other. And so to summarize, what I argue is contrary to say... Uh, Abraham Maslow, who, who provided us with the, uh, you know, the hierarchy of needs to explain why consumers do what they do. You know, there's physiological needs and then safety needs and so on. You go up the hierarchy. The top of the hierarchy is self-actualization, right? Be all that you can be, right? The, the, the famous slogan from uh, the U.S. military. Well, his theory is partly correct. But his theory really comes from what's called a, a humanist view of, 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 of nature, of human nature. In other words, he's really explaining a normative theme, how you ought to be. You should, yes, once you meet your physiological needs, you should strive up the pyramid to get to self-actualization so that you could take a cruise to Alaska and learn about indigenous cultures, right? Uh, okay, that's great. But the reality is that when I go downtown on a Friday night, very few people are engaging in self-actualization. Most people are behaving like rabid animals. So, so in my case, I'm rooting the motivations that drive consumer behavior in clear biological mechanisms. So I don't care about explaining or proposing how we ought to behave the way Maslow is. I just care about explaining why we do the things that we do. And therefore, these four Darwinian modules, survival, reproduction, kin selection, and reciprocity, I think do a good job at achieving that.
<laughs> okay, so that was a great and very long answer to the question. I hope it's not too long. No, no, no. Don't worry about that because in, on my show I let people talk for as long as they want to answer each question. So I don't interrupt. I don't interrupt people at all. So and now let's talk about when consumption goes astray, let's say, and people get into addictive behaviors. You already referred a little bit to that, but would you say that? the reason why that happens stems completely from individual variability that is there are some people that are more innately predisposed toward developing addictive behaviors or uh, for example because nowadays since we have uh, almost unlimited access to consumption and to things related to the four modules you just explained, that uh, that fact might be tweaking our innate mechanisms into consuming more. Well, I think so. The way you've set up the question is slightly off in that it's I don't think it's an either or. I think it's an interaction between the two, which basically speaks to something that evolutionary psychologists regrettably have to constantly fight against which is the idea that, oh, it's biological determinism, it's genetic determinism. Uh, and of course it's not. Evolutionary psychologists argue that for what's called the interactionist view, which is that much of who we are is really an interaction of our genes, our biological blueprints, and the environment. Genes themselves get turned on or off depending on environmental inputs, right? Evolution itself operates within an environment. So the idea that evolution or evolutionary thinking is somehow contrary or is antithetical or is in contra to, to the environment is, is simply false. So, so to your point, I think that there are some evolutionary reasons which I'll explain why someone might succumb to these uh, traps. But then the likelihood of you being someone to succumb to them will vary as a function of individual differences, right? Uh, and this is why you don't have every single male succumbing to pornographic addiction, right? But what we do know is that pornographic addiction is almost exclusively male-based as, as compared to female. So, so it really is a interaction between the environment and our genes. Uh, but I should also mention one, one great metaphor that I love to use uh, for this interaction story to explain the you know, nature versus nurture is what uh, the, the cake metaphor. So if you take all of the ingredients that are typically used for a cake, uh, the eggs, the flour, the sugar, the baking soda, whatever, the milk, uh, and you put them in front of you on the table, each of those ingredients are clearly delineated. I could point to the eggs, I could point to the sugar, I could point to the flour. Now I bake the cake, the cake is finally baked, and then I tell you, please point to the eggs, please point to the sugars, you can't because now it's an inextricable mix. And we are exactly that, we are the cake. For some things, it is almost exclusively genetic. I mean, your eye color is not due to the fact that mommy loved you or not, but for many things, it really is an interaction. Uh, so, so this is why it's really important to kind of disabuse people from the notion that it's nature or nurture. As a matter of fact, nurture exists. I, love, I, think, I think the title of this book comes from Matt Ridley, Nurture by nature, right? Nurture itself doesn't happen as something antithetical to nature. Nurture happens in its form because of nature. Women are socialized to be more sexu sexually chaste than men, not because of the evil patriarchy, not because of sexist, arbitrary double standards. They are socialized to be more sexually uh, restrained because of something called parental investment theory, Robert Rivers. So, so learning is part of our biological heritage, but learning exists in its form because of biology. Do you want me to now explain all the different pathological behaviors and so on? Uh, j just in the interest of time, <coughs> let's perhaps move on to another question. And by the way, because you made that first comment after I posed the last question where you said that I had set up 
perhaps the question in a wrong way because I framed it as an either or but I in fact I did it on purpose because I already knew that you were going to ah, give yeah. an answer along those lines and that was exactly what I was looking for so <laughs> I passed the test <laughs> great okay so uh, what would you reply to people that, for example, were to accuse you of, uh, let's say, oh, Dr. Sad, you're studying uh, the things, the, our innate mechanisms that lead us to consume more or less or more or less of this and that, and so you're selling your soul to the devil and, the, <laughs> and you're cooperating with corporate in interests just to to give them more tools to explore or to exploit the consumer uh, and this is all you're doing yeah uh, the ones who usually proclaim such things are folks who are also on the social justice warrior spectrum they're also ones who have blue hair they're also ones who wear uh the, the pretty scarves free palestine uh so it's, it's utter garbage, right? I mean, I'm not in the business of uh, seeking knowledge so that I could arm corporations to do X or Y. Uh, I'm a behavioral scientist who cares about unlocking the endless mysteries of human nature, how people end up using it. And by the way, it's not clear that the knowledge that I provide will be misused for nefarious purposes. To the contrary, right? Knowledge is truly power and therefore understanding why we might succumb to pathological gambling or pornographic addictions or eating disorders is something that I would think is, is, is a valuable thing to know. So the idea that, again, it stems from a vulgar understanding of marketing, right? Most idiots think of marketing as, you know, uh, I'd like to set up a dance party tomorrow, so how do I create flyers to market that? Uh, right, because I spend most of my time in my lab trying to, you know, uh, create cool uh, electronic dance parties, uh, right? So, so again, it comes from a incorrect understanding of what it means to be a marketing scholar, or in my case, a consumer psychologist, right? I, I simply choose to apply the tools of science in a specific context. That context, I chose it, to go back to an earlier conversation we were having, I chose it to apply it in the consumer context, because this is the place where our incredible human nature manifests itself most readily on a daily basis, right? Uh, look, I could have studied uh, uh, human behavior in prison settings, right? But that is a somewhat more restricted context from which to study human nature. If you wanna study the full range of possibilities of our human nature, to me, consumer behavior is the ideal place. So there is no ulterior motive uh, to the knowledge that I seek to 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 propose to to discover. Uh, this would be like arguing that physicists, uh, you know, are really going down a very uh, dangerous place because you know, bruh, atomic bomb, right? So uh, what could be more disastrous than dropping two bombs on two cities in 1945? that incinerated hundreds of thousands of people. Should we end with physics? Because it was physicists who came up with this. So again, it is this kind of thinking is reserved for the naturally lobotomized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And another thing that I know also gets you very upset very quickly is when, for example, people that, uh, that even know about evolutionary theory and apply it in their work then when it comes to human behavior, suddenly, oh no, that can't really be explained by evolutionary processes. And I mean, an another thing that I usually tell people when I'm confronted with that kind of attitude is that, oh, so you accept readily that, for example, we have a sexual drive and that we feel hunger and thirst and, and that we don't learn those things. And if we didn't have them, we would die and we wouldn't, we wouldn't reproduce. So, and what are those things? Sex, eating, 
drinking and so on. Those are behaviors. Come on, why, why don't you understand it? Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's, you are exactly right that I get very upset. And let me kind of give you a, 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 a background, a, a personal background to why I get so upset. It's actually something that I'm, it's a section that I'm currently working on in my forthcoming book. Uh, I'm genuinely, I'm physiologically, I'm spiritually, I'm mentally injured by stupidity. And I don't mean that in, a, in an arrogant way. I mean that, uh, well, this is the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? It's, it's people who are profoundly idiotic but are fully confident in their idiocy. By the way, Dunning, of the Dunning-Kruger effect, was my professor of psychology at, at Cornell also. They've done it. Uh, so I, I genuinely get, it's as if you attack me in an alley and you start trying to beat me up and I fight against you. This is how I react. I'm, 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 I have righteous indignation at the stupidity because for me, the highest ideal is the, the, the pursuit and the defense of truth. And many of the people who engage in this kind of talk like you're doing, I can't help but think that they're being a bit dishonest, precisely because a lot of them are fellow academics and fellow scientists. So the classic example of such a buffoonish fool, and I hate to mention his name because I don't even want him to get any attention, is a utter schmuck. And I use these words advisedly. I use them precisely to, to, to emphasize how, how, how much of a you know, cretin I think this guy is. Uh, people have told me, don't say, don't pronounce it cretin because this sounds like Crete, the island of Crete. Uh, anyways, so PZ Myers, is a guy who's become uh, quite popular uh, because of a scientific blog that he has. Uh, uh, his scientific prominence is substantially lesser than this glass. This glass has a greater scientific productivity than, than him. It has a greater Google Scholar Citation Index, yet he sits on his blog and pontificates about how we're all morons. I mean, literally every evolutionary psychologist who's probably come on your show or will come on your show is a complete charlatan, is an idiot, is a schmuck, is doing faux science. But P.Z. Meyer, who last published a paper in 1643, is the real guy, is the real scientist. Now, why am I mentioning him? Because he is exactly the epitome of what you're talking about. He is a biologist. He is a committed evolutionist. So it's not as though he doesn't understand biology or he doesn't understand evolutionary theory, but he's perfectly fine using the principles of evolutionary theory to explain the mating behavior of the Amazonian frog and the salamander. But if I use the exact same principle with the exact same evidentiary threshold, if not actually a much higher evidentiary threshold to explain mating behavior in humans, oh, bro, what kind of bullshit scientists are you, right? So he's just a guy who's been parasitized by stupidity and he can't extricate himself from it. This is, by the way, this is not my term. This is a term that I discovered uh, after having written my books called the human reticence effect. The human reticence effect is basically the idea that people are perfectly happy to use evolution to explain the behavior of every single species but humans. Now, this, this example can, can be further extended to the following. Some people are perfectly happy to use evolution to explain human phenomena as long as the phenomena stop at the neck. This is what I call the stop at the neck idiocy, right? So my opposable thumbs, oh yeah, bro, that's evolution. My pancreas, that's evolution. Everything about me is evolution. But the thing that defines my personhood which is my mind, my brain, no, 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 that's not evolution. That operates through some mysterious other agent. So again, it frustrates me because it's one thing to have a guy who sits in his mom's basement without wearing pants sending me hateful messages. It's another thing when supposedly sophisticated academics and scientists succumb to this kind of stupidity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And another thing that is related to that 
And I guess that now we can introduce a little bit of coalitional psychology here is that and, and I'm not referring, of course, to all people that are against evolutionary psychology or evolutionary theory in general, but just to a subset of people that I've been interacting with that. On the one hand, they are for evolution and natural selection, but it seems to me that there are a subset of people that they don't really understand what is natural selection and particularly the modern synthesis, but only are for evolution because of uh, groupish, groupish behavior of being against religious people, for example, because uh, just a few days ago I had a discussion with a guy who, who is precisely like that, he is completely for evolution and completely against religion, and I, I'm not talking about my opinion on religion here, that is another question. But anyway, at a certain point, I managed to expose the fact that he didn't even understand what evolution was about because he believed that, for example, the unit of selection in evolution was the species. This, that's right. So for the good of the species, for this, right. this is actually a, the, the most famous evolutionist to, to propose this kind of thing is is a gentleman by the name of Wynne Edwards, uh, who was the guy who sort of was the last kind of bastion of, you you know, you do something for the survival of the species. You're exactly right. But so your friend, or I don't know if he was your friend, the, the guy that you're talking about is, okay, is, uh, is exactly Dunning-Kruger effect. I call them walking Dunning-Kruger effects because, uh, you know, a lot of people are, well, most people regrettably are, Cognitive misers. Uh, what I mean by that is they're cognitively lazy. So they 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 learn enough about something to sound as though they're semi-proficient in it, and yet hope. And then they go around espousing their very dogmatic views, hoping that the recipient of their message won't be able to challenge them. And this is why I end up spending tons of time of my life fighting all these guys because I do have the knowledge to challenge you. And because of my personality, which gets injured by violations of truth, I end up then going after people precisely because I want to correct the record. Of course, as you can imagine, it's a very exhausting way to live life because as I say, the tsunami of idiocy and lunacy keeps smashing on the shores of reason. And uh, I need more people to join me to defend the edifices of truth. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do here in Portugal, even though I'm still very little, but let's let's hope that I grow because, I mean, it's very frustrating because I don't know how is the intellectual sphere, the intellectual realm, the public intellectual realm, let's say, in Canada, but in Portugal, it is pretty much dominated by things like uh, continental sociology that is derived from postmodernism. Oh, so yeah. it is it is very, very, very frustrating to talk with people here, particularly about social phenomena. Yeah, uh, look, it's no different uh, anywhere in the West. Uh, I call all these folks, since you mentioned postmodernists, intellectual terrorists. Uh, and again, I, I choose these terms precisely because uh, by by having very vivid terms, uh, it allows to truly capture the devastating effect that these people have on public discourse. So a terrorist is someone who, who causes mayhem, right? Uh, the 19 hijackers that brought down the, uh, the Twin Towers were terrorists. Well, there are other forms of edifices, other types of buildings. They're called buildings of reason, right? We erected reason. And what postmodernists do is they come on their planes of bullshit and they squash, they destroy our commitment to reason, to science, to logic. Why does it upset me? Well, because think about, again, to use now a term from economics, right, the opportunity cost of students. How many thousands, hundreds of thousands of students have wasted their time, their careers, their academic trajectories, their parents' tuition, 
learning some of the biggest garbage that is human that that could ever i mean astrology has more coherence than postmodernism i mean that that is literally true okay alchemy has more coherence than postmodernism yet this is what we teach at our universities this is why some of us who are in the public sphere despise all these movements because we're truly committed to, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you study something in the humanity. And, and by the way, a lot of people think, oh, I'm against sociology or the humanities. Not at all, right? But there is a way to study all of these wonderful areas of human import while being committed to reason, right? Uh, the, the postmodernists don't do that. They throw that out. They're nihilists. They're, they're intellectual anarchists. They're intellectual terrorists, and they need to be stopped. Now, I don't know if you... If you've been following the grievance studies story, have you have you followed that a lot? Yes. Yeah, yeah. What do you, what do you think of it? <laughs> well, I I've got completely flabbergasted by it. I mean, I've already knew about the so-called thing that went about in the nineties, I think, right? right? And I've read his book that he wrote it with. Eric Brickmont, I think, yeah. where he exposed some of the methodology that postmodernists use. Uh, nonsense was the title. Yes, exactly, exactly that book. It's a great book, by the way. If people want to read it, it's a great book. But yeah, and I mean, uh, you were saying, uh, and I was thinking <coughs> that many times I even tell people that for me personally, I consider postmodernism to be even more dangerous than the tribalistic and dogmatic parts of religion because uh, postmodernism does something that religion usually doesn't that is it complete it tries to completely undermine any innateness of the human mind so. absolutely yeah and you know sometimes I'll get emails from folks who you know, whenever you, you comment about anything, someone will write to you and say, oh, no, Professor Saad, you're misunderstanding. You know, if only we did true, true, true socialism, then we would live in a utopia. The, the, as actually, I just posted a tweet earlier today, but I've done that many times. The, the, 13 trillions, the 13 trillion examples where socialism has been tried and it led to devastating miseries were not manifestations of socialism, right? If, if only we can set up a true Islamic state, unlike the fake Islamic context of the past 1400 years, then we would all be free, right? I get the exact same thing. I even get it from otherwise supposedly sophisticated thinkers. There's one gentleman who's actually been on my show, I won't mention him as a courtesy to him, uh, who seems like a perfectly rational guy, but he's somewhat very, very offended by my facile attacks on postmodernism. If only I understood postmodernism better, I would understand the beauty of the nuance. Uh, no, postmodernism is bullshit. I mean, yes, does it have little nuggets of banal truths? Yes, we are constrained at times by relativistic uh, realities, right? You're always constrained by your unique personhood. Gee, what a brilliant insight. Okay, what next you've got for me, right? So, no, postmodernism is not misunderstood. It was a movement that was started by several French charlatans, Jacques Derrida, Jacques Lacan, Michel Foucault, all of whom, now I don't have proof of this, I've proposed this theory to some of my colleagues who, some of them actually have known them, I think. My theory is they, through some, some sort of random process of generating gibberish, they actually realized that they could be invited to Princeton and have adoring people listen to them and they said it's a form of runaway selection let's see how far we could take this in the deep recesses of their minds when they went to bed at night and put their head their heads on the pillow they knew that they were full of garbage but there were too many rewards to be had right i mean look at all the attention i'm getting from princeton because of all this folk profundity that i'm saying so I think I would love if at some point someone discovers a diary by these guys where they admit to this, because I genuinely don't believe that anyone could be so mentally deranged as to believe that anything coming out of postmodernism has any value. 
Yes, but I think we already got some sort of a diary, like you say, because isn't there that uh, anecdote that Daniel Dennett tells about that I think it was Richard Rorty that told him about when one time when he was talking with Michel Foucault that he asked him... Uh, oh, yes. what, right, you know what I'm I know the story. Yeah, go, go ahead, I'll tell it. Yeah, and he was talking with Michel Foucault, Richard Rorty, and he asked him, I think, oh, Michel, why do you, when, when I talk with you, why are you so clear? But when you write, I can't understand half of what you're saying. And he told him, basically, paraphrasing that uh, he, had, he had, in fact, to do that. Otherwise, people wouldn't take him seriously in French society. Exactly so. right. And I, so I think it also comes, so this speaks to another point that I criticize about the social sciences in general, and certainly consumer behavior in particular, which of course has gotten some of my colleagues upset at me, although they are coming around. So in, in, math, in, uh, in economics, economists have what's called physics envy, right? You know, I want to be thought of as a very serious mathematics guy. Uh, and therefore, if I'm going to really compete, now I'm speaking as though I'm one of those economists, right? Uh, if I really want to compete against the physicist, I've got to create endless bullshit math, uh, which has nothing to do with any economic reality that anyone would want to model. But God damn, it looks fancy if I put a couple of extra lambdas and betas, right? And I'm speaking as someone who studied math. I mean, my, one of my PhD minors is in, is in statistics, right? I have a degree in mathematics. My MBA, I did an, uh, a, a mini thesis in operations research. So it's not as though, boo, I'm scared of math, right? But I, I could look at uh, a lot of economic theorizing, and it is perfectly detached from this true study of economics because they've become infatuated with the idea of appearing analytically rigorous. Well, I argue, and I'm going to come back to the postmodernists. Now, let's take this idea to a lot of the behavioral scientists, let's say consumer psychologists, right? So if you read a paper in some of the top journals in consumer psychology, not evolutionary psychology, in consumer psychology, it's unbelievably rigorous. It's a two by three by four factorial design. You, you may or may not know these terms. Uh, you do an ANCOVA, an ANOVA, mediational analysis, LISRAL model, PATH model, uh, on and on. And then the final result is after you do study one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A, seven, B, is that uh, consumers who are happy at a restaurant are more likely to return to the restaurant. Holy shit, who could have thought of that? Wow, what a brilliant insight. But the methodology and the data analytic approach is so fancy, it's so scientific, that if it quacks like a duck, and walks like a duck, it must be a duck. Therefore, I must be a very rigorous scientist who belongs in the pantheon of scientists if I am a rigorous methodologist. Well, no, you don't have to do a two by three by four design and so on. Some of the most famous experiments in the behavioral sciences that have stood the test of time, you could explain them to a 10 year old. They're incredibly simple, they're incredibly elegant, but they demonstrate something incredibly powerful about the human condition. Well, so now to speak of the postmodernists and Michel Foucault, what they're doing is exactly that, right? They have nothing of importance to say. But if I say, and I'm now going to put on my random POMO generator, the eigenvector of my uh, praxis is a reflection of the transposed inner self. What does that mean? But God damn, it sounds fancy. So it's all faux posing. It's all faux signaling to go back to signaling theory. And if I could convince enough people that I'm sharp and smart and profound, I win the game. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I guess that you failed a little bit in that uh, POMO sentence because you didn't refer to Freud. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just add the word ego in there. Somewhere in the line, add ego and we're good. Or, or you simply stick Freud into it, even if it doesn't make sense. It, it well, goes exactly. well, anyways. You, you know, yeah, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, now let's just talk a little bit about the concept because I really think this is very important that we can't finish this interview without talking about it. The concept <coughs> of nominological networks of cumulative evidence. Because I guess that this is perhaps the thing that gives more strength to the to evolutionary psychology. Right. right. Uh, so of all of the various attacks on evolutionary psychology, all of which piss me off, the one that by far angers me the most is the one that goes something like this. Evolutionary sciences in general, but certainly evolutionary psychology, is fake science because all you guys do is, you know, you sit with scars and you smoke pipes and you come up with post hoc just so stories, right? Uh, now, the reason why this upsets me is, well, first of all, because the exact opposite is true, but secondly, it is the one that is often made by supposedly sophisticated academics. So I'm even more upset because it's not some random guy on the internet saying this, it's some of my colleagues. And so the way that I started trying to tackle this phenomenon is I started, and, and, and I really developed it through 25 years of trying to convince social scientists of what I was trying to convey to them, is what is the evidence that I need to provide you so that it becomes unassailable for you to argue against me? And it's not a literature review. It's not just, let me tell you about what the literature has found. That's not what it is. It's not a meta-analysis. It's a completely different epistemological way to think about how to construct an adaptive argument, okay? Now, it turns out that someone had already done this in 1859. His name is Charles Darwin. When Charles Darwin was coming up with all of the evidence in support of natural selection, he took many decades to generate that knowledge. And that knowledge came from assiduous observations across many, many, different domains, many, many different fields, many, many different sources of data, which when you put it all together, it became very difficult for anybody to argue against his theory, despite the fact that 150 plus years, people have been trying to discredit him. Well, when I was then working, for example, on my 2007 book, and I had to go into different areas, show what the non-evolutionary approach was, and then demonstrate what the evolutionary lens adds to it or completes it or negates what was said. My mindset was always, what is the evidence that I need to provide you to, uh, to convince you? And, and, and so, then, so then I started, so at that point, the term nomological networks, I hadn't seen. Then I saw a paper by Schmidt and Pilcher in 2004 where they proposed this mechanism which I had been independently doing for all my years. So then I then built on that and created what I now call the nomological networks of cumulative evidence, whereby I argue, so I'll give you maybe specific examples. And for those of you who are interested, uh, I, 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 I provide all of the, 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 the information to what I'm gonna say next in a paper that I published in 2017 in the journal Marketing Research on the epistemological method of EP. The epistemological method doesn't mean methodology, experiments or surveys or observation. It means the actual means of generating knowledge. How do you build arguments? So here's how it works. Uh, I could do, if you want, a few examples, because as you said, I, I truly think that this is uh, probably, of all that we're talking about, the, the things that's, well, all of it I think is important, but nomological networks are truly important. And actually, it's yeah, yeah, I, you can go ahead. I was just, I was just a bit worried, perhaps about the time, because you gave me seventy-five minutes to this <laughs> interview, and we already went through an hour and eight minutes. How about so... we go a bit longer? How's that? Oh, okay, great, great. great. But thank you for for caring about the time. Uh, so the the idea basically is that I want to provide you with evidence that hopefully makes it very difficult for you to counter argue against me. All right, so let's suppose I want to demonstrate that toy preferences are uh, biologically based. 
In other words, contrary to social constructivism, which basically argues that, uh, you know, we become our gender roles are start off because our sexist parents teach little Johnny to play roughly with the blue truck and little Linda to play with nurturance with the pink doll. That's what starts the cascade of gender role specialization. That's what channels our eventual, you know, uh, sex specific natures. Well, so I wanted to test this. Well, is it is it true? So are our toy preferences innate? Uh, or at least do they have some biological signature or is it all social construction? So now I have to start thinking, okay? So this is, uh, by the way, this nomological networks of cumulative evidence is going to be a central thing that I talk about in my next book because I'm trying to convince that my approach is really the way that you tackle endless debates that are taking place in public discourse. So it's not just for evolutionists to use, it's really an epistemological tool you use to build arguments strictly based on evidence, okay? So here's how it works. So I wanna convince you that toy preferences do have a biological signature. What kind of evidence should I get? Well, I could get data from children who are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive development, meaning that they haven't yet reached an age where they could be socialized, and I could explore to see whether their toy preferences are sex specific. So is it the case that little boys will prefer certain types of toys and little girls other types? And the answer is yes. Now, if I stopped right here, so I'm building now this nomological network. This nomological network is like a puzzle. So if I stop at only this data, it would already cast great doubt on the idea that is due to social construction because I just refuted that idea. But I'm not going to stop here. I'm going to build a tsunami of evidence against you. So now I'm going to go on. I could get data from little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a hormonal uh, endocrinological disorder that masculinizes little girls. It makes not only their morphology more masculine, but their behaviors more masculine. Well, I could take girls who suffer from CAH or girls who don't and see whether their toy preferences will shift. Well, guess what? Girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia have uh, toy preferences that are more akin to that of boys. Now, this is looking pretty bad for the social constructivists because now I've got hormonal signatures from a clinical population. But let's go on. I could get data from pediatric endocrinology. This is where they took, as they took uh, using urine samples uh, to measure testosterone levels of little children beginning at seven days old until six months old. And they showed that their circulating levels of testosterone correlated with their toy preferences. That's not looking good. I could get data from funerary monuments, mausoleums, when people die, you build a mausoleum of them, from ancient Greece. And I could look at the depictions of children playing on these mausoleums, and they seem to show little boys playing with certain types of toys and little girls playing with other types. Bit by bit, and I've only given you a small part of my nomological network of cumulative evidence, once I show you the whole thing, you know what your response is? I'm going to show it to you. You're done. Your mouth is open and you shut your mouth. Why? Because I let the data speak for itself. One other quick example. If I want to show, if I want to convince you that the waist to hip ratio preference that men have for women is the hourglass figure. How can I go about showing you that, okay? Is it the case that we just come up with these post hoc stories, or might it be the case that we're actually very careful in building our adaptive arguments? Well, I'll use the nomological networks of cumulative evidence now and show you the extraordinary amount of evidence in support of that contention. Well, we know from the just theoretically, sexual selection presumes that males and females will look for certain attributes in the opposing sex that confer reproductive advantage. This is true across sexually reproducing species. So the female, the female crab will look at a bunch of males, each of whom will, will show his big his claw, and she will invariably pick the one that has the biggest claw for clear evolutionary reasons. There is no theoretical reason to presume that humans 
don't have their mating preferences arise out of the same mechanism. So the box of theoretical evidence is already there. Now we go to medical evidence. Well, there is medical evidence that shows that the nobility, the fertility, the health of women who have that hourglass figure is better. So now we've got the direct currency from evolution showing that if you have that preference, it leads to reproductive and health advantages. Now I could go to cultures from 50 different settings, right? I don't just run the study with 30 undergrads at Ohio State University. I go to the Yanomomo tribe in the Amazon, and I go to the Hadza in Africa, and I go to the Bedouins in the Negev Desert, and I show that they all seem to have the exact same preference. I could do the studies on preference using paper and pencil. I could do brain imaging studies. I could show men different photos of women and see the, where the pleasure center of their brains is it more likely to become active if they see the, the girl with the hourglass figure. I could use eye tracking studies. I, I did a study where I looked at the female escorts on, online. How do they advertise the prostitutes online? How do they advertise their measurements? And the study was done using 48 different countries. And guess what? The average hourglass, the average figure was that of the hourglass. I could take congenitally blind men. This is not my study, regrettably. I wish it was me who had done it because it's the most brilliant study ever. You take congenitally blind men. These are men who've never had the gift of sight. Therefore, they couldn't have been socialized by sexist cosmopolitan magazines, right? They couldn't have been socialized by Hollywood images. Guess what? Congenitally blind men prefer the hourglass figure via touch, okay? So I, I won't give you the, the rest of the stuff, but the data that I'm giving you is so overwhelming that you can't argue against it. This is why I go in front of an audience of 500 people, 95% of whom might be very hostile to evolutionary theory, and shh, I don't hear a single word from them. Why? Because the chip that's on my shoulder is, is not coming from personal arrogance. It's coming from the fact that I've got my nomological network protecting me. And this is what I'd like people to, to, to develop as a, as a form of, if you like, mental hygiene. This is what I'm going to be talking about in, in my next book. Don't use emotions to build your arguments. Don't use political ideology. Don't use tribalism. Go where the data leads you. That's exactly what nomological networks do. <laughs> yes, and now I'm going to tell you about two things. One of them is another anecdote that you can use on Twitter and Facebook if you want, because it's something that happened very recently here in Portugal. In fact, it was last Monday. But first of all, let me just tell you this. In fact, last February, I did a video for my channel that was perhaps the only one I did where I was the only person appearing there because I was just starting the channel and I couldn't get any guests for that week so just to put the video out that week I did a video to try to show people how through science we can demonstrate that sex differences are real and inspired by you and inspired by for example people like Dr. Steven Pinker and the Blank Slate and Robert Sapolsky and others who also have this approach I used precisely the approach of the cumulative uh, the nomological networks of cumulative evidence and I referred to uh, evolutionary psychology, personality psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, neuroendocrinology, embryology, primatology, yeah. comparative psychology. So just to show people in a very simple way, because I didn't get too much into details, just to not bother people too much about it, but just to show people that we can completely build this scientific structure from the lower levels to the upper levels and it is all and now to borrow a word from Mio Wilson consilient right I, I, I was gonna exactly introduce that word because one of the things that I've argued in all of my works and if you see if you go to uh, the evolutionary basis of consumption the last chapter where I talk about benefits of Darwinizing consumer research one of the fundamental benefits one of the most primary benefits is 
Cancillions, which, by the way, in the paper where I introduce uh, nomological networks of cumulative evidence and, and you know how it could benefit the behavioral science and so on, uh, uh, I talk about the building of consilient trees of knowledge. Right. The the idea is that there are unique epistemological uh, benefits that are reaped via evolutionary thinking that you don't get anywhere else. Consilience is one of them. Consilience is a term that was reintroduced into the vernacular, if you'd like, by, as you said, E.O. Wilson. Everybody who's watching this show needs to read his book from the late 1990s, Consilience, which is basically unity of knowledge, right? The idea that things that appear disparate are connected, right? Well, now think how consilience is related to nomological networks of cumulative evidence, right? Because to to you have to think in a grand way in a synthetic way to be able to build these nomological networks right i'm not restricted to doing a literature search only within cognitive psychology or evolution psychology on the contrary i'm saying what is the evidence that i can gather from all areas of human endeavor that could hopefully strengthen my position it's a very different way of thinking and that's why charles darwin is charles darwin right it's precisely because he had the natural instinct to say you know i'm i'm putting together a pretty dangerous idea here that's going to get a lot of people pissed off i better be really careful about how i construct my argument so he is the original nomological network guy right and so the more people who learn how to think this way the fewer you know, la, 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 I'm not listening to you, conversations we will have because I will present my nomological network, you will present yours, and may the best man win. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let me tell you about the anecdote because well, this, le this last Monday, it happened something that I guess that even you won't believe it. That is, okay. we have a show here in Portugal in public television that is called Pros e Contras, that in English is something like pros and cons. So you put three people in each side debating something, debating a theme. And the theme of this last show was the Me Too movement. And so you have people defending the Me Too movement and people against. And there was this guy that I already knew about that was in the audience and at a certain point they gave they gave him the word and he, he basically checks out all the boxes of someone who is intellectually who suffers from intellectual degeneracy so is <laughs> is a postmodernist is a third wave feminist he defends polyamory he is for bdsm i mean his his um, thesis his master thesis was done uh, influenced by the work of Michel Foucault, as we already talked about here. And this stood up and he said, oh, people have to know about this. We have this sort of micro violences going around in society where, for example, if people force children to give a kiss to their grandparents, this is something very little that accumulates over time and that is why I arrive at my class and I have 40 students and all of them say that they can't deal, they can tell no to someone who wants to sexually abuse them. Because originally they were forced to kiss their grandparents. Yes, and you're being for, forcefully, uh, ex physically expo exposed to contact with other people. I think I could beat that story because you, you threw the challenge that I may. There is a, I think, Australian sex expert who said that the changing of diapers of your children, in a sense, might be a form of aggression because they can't really give consent or something to that effect. So I think that's even worse because you're you're setting the aggression the microaggression even earlier than having to kiss your your parents. So it's better to have your children wallow for 3 4 5 years in feces and urine because after all 
you wouldn't want to change them because you're, you know, you're, you know, they, they don't, they can't give consent. And look, this is just a breakdown of the human mind, right? I mean, and this is why, forgive me not to plug, but uh, my next book currently now is, is tentatively titled The Parasitic Mind, but I'm not sure if that will be the final title. But that's because in what I'm doing in the book is arguing that in the same way that uh, all sorts of parasites uh, could infect various species' brains, causing them to behave in incredibly maladaptive ways. Well, I expand that story to idea pathogens, right? In the same way that you could be parasitized by an actual physical brain worm, you could be parasitized by idea worms, by idea pathogens. And that causes people, like this guy that you just spoke about, to say things that are so breathtakingly removed from, you know, uh, common sense, folk psychology, right? Uh, most people, whether they're smart or not, have a clear sense of how the world works, what's up, what's down, what's right, what's left, the most basic sort of Cartesian way of viewing the world. Well, what these parasites do is they completely rewire your circuitry. I mean, if not literally, in, 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 metaphorically in your ability to think. Uh, look, I've been going after the last few days, uh, Rachel McKinnon. This is a woman, and I put in quotes because she's a biological male, so simply saying that you are a woman doesn't make you a woman. Uh, just like I can't say I'm a four-year-old child because otherwise it's, you know, trans ageism, right? There is a thing called my biological age, and there's no way for me to move myself away from that. Uh, so she won, she won the world championship of cycling, where she crushed everybody else. And, and she was, I'm saying she because that she self-identifies as female. She won this and she goes on Twitter and she's very, very, uh, you know, bombastic about it, very grandiose. First time ever trans woman wins world championship ever. So I then go, go after her but politely. I actually say, hey, professor, uh, Dr. McKinnon, she's a professor somewhere. Uh, why don't you come on my show so we could discuss it? Because as, as someone who is so into trans rights, I mean, she she's so cares about rights. I wonder if the rights of all the women who lost to you, whether they matter, or is it the case that all the, and here's some nomological, all the anatomical, physiological, biological, hormonal, and behavioral differences between men and women, do you think they put you at an advantage? Or is that all part of the transphobic patriarchy. Well, if this person were intellectually honest, well, first of all, she would look who I am. She would see the platform that I have. she say, well, my God, I would love to come on this guy's show because I want to demonstrate that my position is correct. This guy is offering a forum that's about a thousand times bigger than anything that I could ever hope for, a million times bigger. And I could talk. What, what does she do? She blocks me, right? Why does she do that? Because she cannot withstand scrutiny. What's the lesson in this? Don't back away from battles because you think you're going to be attacked by the politically correct police. If everyone does their part in challenging the intellectual terrorists, we will win the battle of ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Dr. Seth, can you give me much more time or not? Let's do because... another 10 minutes, what do you think? Okay, okay. So let's just tackle one big question about psychology in general. And you already talked a little bit about your book. So I don't know if by the end you will want to refer to the same things you already referred to. Okay. But anyway, okay. So um, I guess that recently I, I've been interacting with certain people that tried to undermine psychology as a scientific discipline and saying that it was not really scientific. And for example, they referred to this recent incident, incident, well, uh, about the marshmallow test, because I think last June someone published um, at 
a study where they tried to replicate the marshmallow test originally from Wal uh, Walter Mitchell right in the 70s and they couldn't do it at least exactly along those lines of four year olds trying to avoid eating the marshmallow and then that predicting future behavior, future ability to delay gratification and things like that. But anyway, they, they picked up on that to try to undermine the entire field of psychology, saying that it wasn't really scientific. But what is funny about the fact is that uh, they refer to the fact that Dr. Michel wrote, I guess, in 2013 in a book that I haven't read, but they refer to that, that what he was trying to achieve with that test was to try to devise ways to improve the capacity of delaying gratification in children. Uh, and that would have been the initial point, let's say. And, and then these people, at the same time that they are saying, oh, so you see, they try to create uh, or to paint this as an innate mechanism, as some people being born with more or less ability to delay gratification, but in fact, Again, it is completely society that influences people to more or less delay gratification. But what I think it's very interesting about this is that these same people that try to paint psychology as not being a real science, a real science are the ones that then pick up on a psychological concepts like uh, delaying gratification uh, and make claims about it. And the problem is that by doing that, they, they're basically trying to do science in the field of psychology. <laughs> well, cognitive consistency is not the forte of many of these ideologues, right? So you're demonstrating that they're being cognitively inconsistent. Of, of course, that, that goes with the fact that you're not being intellectually honest, but to to answer your general point as to you know the uh, you know is psych psychology a science, it, it is breathtakingly idiotic to argue that uh, the, the the brains that are creating science are called human. They, they they reside in humans. If you want to study human behavior, the human predilection, human nature. It's called psychology. Now, the fact that oftentimes uh, you have non-replicable non findings or you have suspicious findings or you have shoddy research doesn't say anything about whether psychology is a science. It basically says that at times scientists are not rigorous. At times, scientists don't adhere to the principles of the scientific methods as much as they should do. But there's nothing inherent about the study of human behavior that is not scientific. As far as we know, the most complex organ that exists in the universe is our human mind. What do you propose that we use to study that human mind? It's called psychology in its various forms. Now, there are all sorts of idiots who use facile cues in deciding what is science or not. So for example, and I actually went after, and I don't mean to imply that he's idiot because he's a, he's a friend, although he was idiotic in this case. Ali Rizvi is a uh, pathologist by training who was someone who came on my show, and I like him a lot, but you know, people make mistakes. And in his case, at one point, he started attacking psychologists uh, because, you know, it's not it's fake science well, of course psychologists are incredibly more scientists than a pathologist right a, a, a someone who studies medicine is not being trained to be a scientist right they're, they're trained as a auto mechanic of the human body right which is fine and I need it and it's a wonderful it's a noble profession but they're not being trained in the scientific method so it's it's quite ironic that someone who is certainly not a scientist is actually, and, and by the way, the, the people that he criticized are some of the most sophisticated uh, uh, scientists. It was actually David Schmidt, it was Jeffrey Miller, it was another gentleman who was a social psychologist, I mean really top, top guys. 
The only one that he said was a real scientist was a woman named Deborah So, who is a uh, sexual neuroscientist. That to him sounded scientific because you know, bruh, she wears a white lab coat when putting people through the fMRI. So I started trolling Ali hard as I do when I get pissed off at someone and he ran away. Why? Because I demonstrated what an idiot he was being. So if I use fMRI to study the neural activation patterns of a salmon, of a fish, I'm a scientist, I'm a zoologist. If I use fMRI to study the behavior of consumers in terms of how they react to fear-based advertising, bruh, is that really science? So studying a salmon is science. Studying a human consumer is not science. So it stems from people not understanding what it is to be a scientist. A scientist is simply someone who uses the scientific method, right? So you could be a historian and be a scientist, you could be a sociologist and be a scientist, and you could be a physicist and be a scientist. Now the idea that because we disagree on a lot of stuff in a field, that means it's not scientific, is itself moronic. Physicists can't agree on whether the universe is expanding or contracting. Physicists can't agree on whether string theory is true or is a bunch of utter bullshit. So the idea that uh, discussions, debates, the uncertainty of scientific knowledge within a field is a manifestation of it not being science is again idiotic. What upsets me is the arrogance with which people attack. So you get some random guy with an egg as his Twitter, right? Who writes to you and says, but you know, you're not a real scientist. I mean, you study human behavior. Now imagine someone who has spent 25 years who did all that I did. So, so then I will usually troll that person and oftentimes they'll shut down their Twitter account because they feel so embarrassed, right? Because I will write back and say, okay guys, and I'll tag a lot of my famous scientist colleagues. Hey guys, the trick is up, the jig is up. It's time for us to pack it in. We've been found out to be frauds. Let's look for a new job. So imagine the arrogance of someone who comes after you, after you've dedicated your life to the pursuit of knowledge and tells you you're not a real scientist because you, you don't wear a lab coat, right? Uh, of course, psychology is a real science. Of course, sociology is a real science. The problem in these fields, unlike physics, although it's now coming to physics, is that the social sciences are more prone to being parasitized by ideology. You follow what I mean? So it's not that the epistemology of sociology or of psychology is any less scientific. It's that just by the nature of what you study, it's difficult to politicize uh, the, uh, you know, the, the atomic number of uranium. But it's a lot easier to politicize things that we study in sociology or psychology. But that doesn't make it less scientific. It simply makes it that we have to be more careful, more assiduous in being honest scientists and only following the scientific method. Does that give you a very long-winded answer to your question? Oh, it's perfect as it is. Okay, so Dr. Said, we really have to go. So would you like to tell people perhaps when your new book will be out? Right, so uh, if all goes well, I should hopefully have it uh, ready uh, with my publisher by maybe uh, end of the summer, and then depending on how quick the rest of the process, I would say I would love for it to be ready by early 2020. So in about a year and a few months, hopefully you can all be consuming the next book. Oh, by the way, I guess you already know who's the person who has to receive a signed copy. Ah. <laughs> Fair enough. Remind me then, and I know that you are not one who is shy of being persistent, so I'm sure I'll be receiving many emails. I do want to give you a shout out before we leave, because I think we mentioned this offline, and this is a, a strong compliment to you, but more importantly, it's something that should hopefully motivate other people. Uh, Mr. Lopez here, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? 
uh, it's Lopes. But I guess that for, for people who speak English, it's a bit difficult. Okay. To... Apologies for butchering your last name. You you started this channel without any, you know, a priori advantages. It's not as though you were a famous academic who could call upon all these other guests to come on your show. You decided that you wanted to get engaged. You wanted to create uh, something that would contribute to the public discourse, and you set out. and And I and I I know maybe you're not ready to announce. You told me offline a, a guest who's coming later, maybe next year, who's a very famous person. You've had many other famous people on your show, and you did it from truly no privileged position. You're not a famous uh, uh, comedian or actor or scientist. You're just one guy who had the uh, the will to create a platform. That to me is a terribly important lesson to take away from everybody who's watching this. People often write to me and say, look, I wanna get engaged, but I don't have your credentials, I don't have your platform. I, no, you don't need it. Joe Rogan is arguably more influential in terms of his platform than NBC, ABC, CBS, all of the mainstream, I mean, literally combined, right? When people go on his show, I mean, I could go on his show and walk anywhere and I will be stopped 50 times on the street because people have recognized me from Joe Rogan, right? Now, of course, Joe Rogan is a, is a celebrity and so on, but he didn't have any direct way by which to connect to all of these very different people. But now anybody and everybody who wants to have a platform is more than pleased to appear on Joe Rogan. So whether it be Joe Rogan or you or anybody else, we all have the capacity given today's tools to contribute to the battle of ideas. So if you say, but I don't want to because I don't have a voice, then you are a coward and it's on you for not getting engaged. So look to your example and get engaged. Okay, well, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know what to say at now, but I guess Dr. Sev, thank you a lot for the kind words, sir. And I, I mean, perhaps in the future, in the near future, I hope we could have another conversation because, in fact, I had another 200 trillion questions for you. We'll do it so again, I promise. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and see if you can make a pledge there. I would really be thankful for that. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanche, Per Helga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gelinas and Jim Frank. Thank you a lot for all.